Thank you so much, Steve. Yes, it has been a long time since the Fountain Casino. For those of you who want to know what that's about, uh, we will tell you later. Um, thank you again so much for inviting me. It's just been ex very exciting. The talks have been really, really spectacular. Um, and um, I want to thank Henry and Serge and all the staff who've helped me so much so far. So without further ado, this is a, a talk I'm going to give. Those, that's my artwork. Because I'm, as you'll see, there's too many words and not enough pictures in my slides. But at least the APA artists were were particularly good at uh, rendering some of the ideas I'm going to talk to you about today. So here's some take-home messages. Some of them may not make sense yet, but hopefully by the end of the talk, where you see this slide again, they will make some sense. First of all, risk-taking, contrary to stereotypes, is not just due to impulsivity and emotion, whether in adults or in adolescents. And I'm going to talk about both. Uh, it is not necessarily just the triumph of system one over system two or type one over type two. So it's not a question of just unreasoning analysis uh, or lack of analysis. It is in fact often due to too much analysis, what we've called a kind of hyper-rationality. So a lot of teenagers, perhaps most teenagers who take risks, are taking calculated risks. Calculated not in the sense that they get a calculator out, but they're trading off risk and reward and making a very cold kind of not emotional decision. Now this is not to say, and there's lots and lots of evidence, including reviews of the literature that I base this on, not just my own work. There is an impulsive kind of risk taking, but that's in addition, it's a very different kind of risk taking than this more rational, in quotes, or hyper rational trading off of risk and reward. So hopefully I've surprised you already. So there are two different kinds of routes to risk taking. There's this reasoned route, very logical, almost hyper logical. And then there's this impulsive route. And they both occur. Um, but we think of it only stereotypically as one kind of risk taking. FTT stands for fuzzy trace theory there. And this is a the theory I'm going to talk about. And this predicts this and other developmental reversals. So it predicts um, this increasing risk aversion for rewards with age. So this is the very famous, famous uh, examples going back to Bernoulli and Tversky and Kahneman and up to the present moment where if we give you a, a comparable gamble and a sure thing, most people prefer the sure thing. So this tendency to prefer um, to avoid risk, to be, have an antipathy towards risk, that goes up with age. But it goes up with age for two, two reasons. One, the reward sensitivity that you're probably pretty familiar with. Again, the emotion, the impulse, that, being attracted to the reward. But also at the same time, the nature of the thinking changes so that in fact, ironically, you become more biased by gist, more biased by meaning. This leads you to avoid risk to be in fact, what economists would say is not rational by their technical strict definitions of rationality. So you get more irrational with age. I remember the first time I published on this, and, and uh, people were very surprised, looking for framing effects or irrational inconsistencies in little children. And I said, the little children will be rational. And as you get older and older, you'll become more and more irrational, more and more inconsistent. And that's what we found. That was predicted by fuzzy trace theory. And I'll give you details. So this is just the take home messages for now. And we predicted this reversal. Um, Defoe et al. have a wonderful review of the literature of risk taking in Psychological Bulletin. I highly recommend that to you. And it takes all the studies of risk taking. And again, it pits the, the two theories of risk taking against one another, the two developmental theories. One of them being imbalance theory, which is, really draws very heavily on dual process theory. So you've been paying attention closely to the dual process kinds of approaches. It takes that approach and, and interprets it developmentally. Uh, in, the, in the idea that there's an imbalance between reward sensitivity and the self-control, you know, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex kind of inhibition. That's on the one hand. And then it compares that to the predictions of fuzzy trace theory. And, and uh, in many cases, it confirms fuzzy trace theory's predictions. One of the key ones being, as you go from childhood to adolescence, what do you think? Do you think risk preference, preference liking of risk goes up or does it go down? What do you think? Yeah. It actually goes down. Ah, you read, you lo looking ahead. <laughs> Most people think, right, that teenagers are more risk loving than children, but in fact, it's the opposite direction. So that's the kind of straightforward prediction that differs across these two approaches. 
All right, so I want to point out that although <laughs> there's been much talk about, and it's good at least to deal with contradictory data, it's better than to ignore it, but to post hoc speculate, I can explain it after the fact, everything in its opposite is a problem, right? You look for things that are novel predictions as a post hoc explanation. So we won't, don't want to use this word explain too loosely. You want to look for, for theories that predict surprising things, not just that after you know the results can kind of make a story up with a lot of patches and assumptions on it to explain. These are not the same. This question was asked yesterday, so I, I'm glad I have it on my slide. The laboratory risk preference, in fact, does seem to correlate with real life risk taking. And again, this is not just my lab, but other labs have shown that hypothetical choices even, some of mine are in what's called incentive compatible, meaning you get paid based on what you chose. Others are hypothetical. They tend to correlate with each other, and more importantly, they tend to predict real life risk taking. So when people go out in the world, things like unprotected sex and things like that are predicted by laboratory tasks about things like money. You wouldn't think that, but it actually it seems to be the case. And this goes back many, many um, uh, years to work by Sarah Lichtenstein, for example, and Fischoff, where they went and they followed people in Las Vegas around and wrote down what they bet on and showed that some of the fundamental phenomena discovered in the lab were in fact being played out in real life um, in Las Vegas for money. So theory-driven programs do reduce unhealthy risk-taking. There's also another thing that people have said, it's particularly people like Larry Steinberg, whom I admire greatly. Do we have this on tape? <laughs> we have this, Larry, I admire greatly <laughs> his work. But he says that um, programs to reduce risk-taking in adolescents do not work. This is false. Again, not just my work, but other people's work, work by Fischoff, work by Doug Kirby, showing that in fact, there are curricula and intervention that do reduce unhealthy risk taking in teenagers. So again, it's not just a driven by impulse in the moment. It's affected by information and knowledge, but also by the way you think. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about an intervention based on all this laboratory stuff that we did with real teenagers to look at whether we could reduce their unhealthy risk taking, like unprotected sex and that sort of thing. So theory-driven programs reduce unhealthy risk taking and risk preferences and the way the brain uh, activates can be changed. And we're doing some neuroscience and neuroimaging research that I'm very excited about. And uh, Vinod's uh, work uh, pointing out the importance of the parietal cortex is actually very relevant. There we go. So speaking of which, speaking of the brain, quick tour of the brain. The, um, We've talked a little bit about uh, the dopamine reward pathways already. And I should say, by the way, the dorsal striatum is a little lower than shown here. Let me see if I can, it's really more right about here. It's subcortical, right? So this is the reward pathways. Things like the dorsal striatum are related to reward-related learning. So when you, know, you do something and it has a good outcome that gets reinforced uh, by learning is go toward that outcome that got reinforced versus when you get burned, avoid. Um, and then there's things like the nucleus accumbens, which has been shown in adolescence and work by uh, Adriana Galvan and so on to activate in response to the magnitude of predicted reward, uh, and particularly more so in, in teenagers than in um, uh, adults. So there is something to this story about reward sensitivity. That's part of what's right. It's just not the whole story. So you have this, these kinds of pathways. And one of the things that should be obvious, it's not a particular just area in the brain that lights up. In fact, it's systems that light up and that activate together and work together. So, so that's, this is to give you some sense of that. Mental representations of decisions. We talk about the prefrontal cortex, but also the parietal cortex, I think has been underestimated. In fact, if you look at the, the areas of the brain that are association areas, as opposed to sensory motor areas, this includes not only the, the, the vaunted prefrontal cortex, but also the parietal cortex. It's an association area. It gets inputs from lots of areas of the brain. And in fact, it's one of the later developing areas of the brain um, and uh, differs uh, ontogenetically as well as phylogenetically. So, so I was very excited when, when Vinna talked about the parietal cortex. So that's just a little background. So fuzzy trace theory. Why do we call it fuzzy trace theory? And I'm going to be talking about gist a lot. The fuzzy traces are the gist traces. So this is in general as you walk through life, as you encode information. So as I'm looking out at you, I'm encoding the gist 
of the audience as well as verbatim memory for individual faces. When you, we give you information about choices, you encode the verbatim information as well as the gist in parallel. And the gist is this fuzzy, impressionistic, bottom line meaning. In other words, gist means what you think it means. Yeah. It's a technical term, but it means what you think it means. All right. So we have uh, the dual processes here. Verbatim encodes and processes the literal surface details. For those of us who, who studied psycholinguistics, this is the surface form that Chomsky talked about ages ago, right? The exact wording or Kinch talked about. Uh, just encodes the bottom line meaning. So people tend to remember the substance of information or the gist of information, the simple sort of essence of it. And they represent it, in fact, at multiple levels of precision. But what do they remember a week from now, a month from now, like after this class, a month from now, you're probably going to remember or access more the gist of what I said rather than the verbatim and of the speakers. So what I talked about in the, the title about logic versus poetry, I guess we should put logic in quotes there, really. The, the, by logic, I mean the literal kind of sense of the verbatim detail. So strictly logical to the point of not getting metaphors, you know, that sort of logical. And then the poetry is the gist. And why am I identifying that with poetry? Well, I've done research on actual memory for metaphor. And in fact, there is a gist of metaphorical meaning that is represented in the brain and, recover and retained over long periods of intervals. But what I mean here more is this intuitive quality that gist has. It's processed in a more impressionistic way. You sort of gather the bits and pieces and begin to extrapolate beyond what I'm saying even before I finish saying it. It's impressionistic, the way poetry is. You know, we don't quite know what it means, but it gives us a feeling, that kind of thing. So that's what I'm trying to get at here. Rather than this strictly serial, very much you know, literal kind of thinking, which we identify with advanced reasoning. But what I'm saying is think in a new way. Maybe the advanced reasoning we do is this meaning-based, impressionistic kind of thinking. Maybe that's advanced reasoning, not the way a computer would think. We think of it, you know, logic and computer have, computers have been our metaphors for mind. And what I'm trying to offer is a new metaphor for mind of fuzzy intuitionism um, as advanced cognition. And I think we actually think both ways, but they're different modes of thinking. So, so we know here that reasoning is not necessarily lost logic in the sense of traditional assumptions. How do you solve these syllogistic reasoning problems? We've done research on that, on transitive inference, on, on, on uh, uh, pragmatic inferences, all kinds of things. How does the advanced reasoner actually engage in reasoning? And what we're suggesting is they engage in this gist-based reasoning in parallel with this verbatim, more literal kind of reasoning. Reasoning can reflect rote memory. Like, does everybody know what rote means, by the way? Rote is like you memorize the answer and you're spitting it back, but you don't understand it, right? So you can memorize um, multiplication tables, but not really understand the operation of multiplication. So you have it memorized, you do it, but you don't really know why it's the right answer, right? That would be verbatim kinds of ways of solving problems. And then there's just ways of solving problems, which uh, transfer and are retained and are more conceptual. And precision should not be misidentified with accuracy. Being precise and in the weeds and in the details, right, is not necessarily being more accurate. These are two different things, being accurate and being precise. Does that make any sense? Okay. Good. Nice of you to nod at me. <laughs> so think about real life. So you go into the doctor and you have to decide whether to vaccinate your child. This is a really important, timely question, right? And many people are saying no to vaccination. It's an interesting problem. So the doctor tells you, and these are real statistics about real vaccinations, it's your child, if they did not get vaccinated, is 23 times more likely to get this dread disease. So what do you encode about that? Well, you encode, and for a short period you have available in your mind, maybe as you're on your way out of the doctor's office, it's already fading, right? 23 times more likely. But you base your decision usually as an adult on the gist of that information. And the gist is something like, that's a huge increase in risk if I don't vaccinate my child. Now, you might say to yourself, if you're really numerate, hey, it might still be small, right? Because it's a multiple, but it's not. But most of us take away, it's, that's a huge increase in risk for making that choice. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So just to recap what we've said, the gist is the bottom line meaning of information. It doesn't, we're talking numbers, words, any meaningful stimulus, pictures, anything that has a meaning to it. And we process, as humans, we process meaning of like clouds and rocks, right? We process, that's part of what we do. We are meaning makers, right? 
So it's vague and qualitative. It's based on all the things that we know that affect the meaning, right? Your emotion, your culture, your worldview, all of your subjective factors affect the gist that you encode. The verbatim, on the other hand, is very literal, right? It, it is a symbolic representation. So you have to recognize words and so on and so forth. But it's a literal surface form, detailed kind of representation. It's quantitative when numbers are involved. It's not necessarily quantitative. If you're, I'm not talking about numbers, then of course, obviously, it's not quantitative. It could be wor exact wording if it's a verbal problem, right? But in many of the problems I'm going to show you, there are numbers. And the precise quantitative details are part of the verbatim representation as opposed to the gist. And this is based on research on narrative and psycholinguistics and things like that. All right. So if you have different kinds of representation, these afford or support different ways of thinking. If you verbatim representations have enough detail to do very precise operations on them, right? Just representations, on the other hand, tend to afford these more uh, intuitive kinds of ways of processing information. So they tend to both support different kinds of reasoning. And I'm going to use sort of verbatim-based processing, gist-based processing as a kind of shorthand for that. The kinds of representation that are preferentially based on verbatim representations versus gist. And by the way, I don't mind if somebody stops me if I'm being unclear. It's OK. Ask questions. So, this is Rene Descartes over there, which I believe is, Vim is on your name tag. <laughs> so Rene Descartes, um, really, really smart, obviously. Cartesian dualism has been very influential. The dual process theories that we've talked about today are influenced by Rene Descartes. But we want to say that there is more than those straightforward difference between reason and emotion, right? Between the animal spirits and, you know, that are, and the human intelligence. There's more than that, right? In addition, there's this verbatim and gist representations. They coexist. It's a parallel processing model, which you've all heard about already, which is great. As opposed to a default interventionist model, you're always processing them both in parallel. And we realize it's a very strong assumption to say they're independent. It's kind of almost unbelievable, right? But we have, we measured stochastic dependence. We've had large sample sizes. We've manipulated these things so they cross over, so you have double dissociations. So it's as though there's two minds one of verbatim mind and one more of a gist mind that operate independently. And that can be elicited so that you contradict yourself even. We can create that at will in the laboratory. This, this is really a surprising difference with standard dual process theory. In fuzzy trace theory, we say that this emphasis on gist-based processing, this intuitive processing, increases with expertise and experience, with development. It, it's the basis of a, the most advanced reasoning is typically gist based. So there's a real controversy there. So that's why we predict these developmental reversals, where people, where adults seem to be more irrational. They're showing these judgment and decision-making biases and heuristics more than children who are being logical and objective, right? That grows with age. So that's one of the, the predictions that I don't think that standard dual process theory can predict. They can predict maybe no difference, but they can't predict a significant reversal. And there are many, many studies now that have found that, including a wonderful study by, by Henry over here, Markovitz, uh, that I just love on transitivity and how the bias to overinterpret transitive relations, in fact, grows with age. So when you say, a is a friend of B and B is a friend of C, little kids will say, but A is not necessarily a friend of C. And that is logical. And as you get older, you're more likely to say that fallacious thing. Because in fact, typically, that would be the case. So we talk about heuristics and biases. It's not all errors are just based, not all errors. Some errors are just, you can't keep track of the numerical totals or there's some other kind of executive process. But many of these systematic below chance kinds of errors that are, are based on meaning, they're processing, they're going beyond the data, and that's the source of the bias. All right, evidence. So let's talk about actual data, yes. Data, yes. So this is, imagine I, I read to you a list of words, sour, candy, sugar, good, taste. Do you get, are you getting like a toothache? <laughs> so, but I never present the word sweet to you. And then I ask you, a few minutes from now, if you didn't have this in front of you, tell me the words I just said to you. So this is a recall test, recall of words, right? Many of you, the majority of you will say, I said the word sweet, 
right? This is what's called false memory. It's not a random memory. You don't just say, uh, you said the word cardboard, right? You say, uh, you said the word sweet. Sweet is, co is semantically connected to the theme of these words. And we've shown even when the words are not associated, when they're only semantically related, it shows significant false memory. So it has something to do with this meaning connection among these words. And in fact, we know what happens, right? Yes? Yeah, the association tests are things like Freud used to do. Like, if I give you sour, what's the first word that comes to your mind, kind of thing. So you can look at association norms based on that. But even if you control for that, so that things are not together stimulus response, because remember, stimulus response is dumb, literal, verbatim thinking, right? We're talking semantic or meaning associations. So even when you control for that, you get these huge false memory effects. Good question. So what happens with development? Well. As you can see, here's five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 11-year-olds, and 20-year-olds. And verbatim memory here is true memory. That's memory for the words that really were on the word list, words like sour and so on that you really did see. So your ability to recall the verbatim words goes steadily up. But what about the word sweet? And others, and this, we've seen this, by the way, I've shown this with sentences, we've shown this with recognition, we have math models of these things, aren't you glad I didn't present that, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> so this is just an example. As you can see, the tendency to say the word sweet was in fact exactly what you said on the list, because we give them very careful instructions. Only tell me back exactly what we said to you, word for word, right? And nevertheless, they will falsely report more and more often, you said the word sweet when we didn't. And in fact, if you look at the difference between the true and false memory, net accuracy actually goes down. Meaning the difference between true and false here gets smaller. So the little kids, although they recall less, they have a bigger discrimination between what was actually objectively said versus the semantically related. Now one of the things that, yeah, if you're following this argument along, you're thinking to yourself probably, yeah, but these are big words and kids don't understand words like sour and, you know, maybe these are little five-year-olds, they don't. So people have gone out and replicated this and they were, they were adversarial kinds of replications where people said, I don't believe this, this can't be right. You can't become more inaccurate with age, right? So they created child-normed lists, words that little kids know the meaning of. So they checked with other four-year-olds, do you know this meaning? And in fact, this effect is robust. In fact, there's been 55 studies. When we originally introduced this was 2002, there's been 55 studies, including our work and other people's work, and 53 of them have found this pattern out of the 55. I think the others were null, but I can't remember. There's two. <laughs> so this is a very robust pattern. It's actually reminiscent of some of the things that Piaget talked about and Lynn Libin has summarized, where you get this sort of meaning-based distortion that increases with age, yeah. at the same time that the verbatim accuracy is also going up. All right. So. So what about individual differences? So let's think about this as a grid, okay? So imagine like, um, let's see, verbatim low and gist low. And verbatim, uh, uh, let's see, gist high and gist uh, and verbatim high. So low, low, high, high, you get the idea. <laughs> so imagine individual differences, and we've done modeling work on this. So, so the, the undergraduate is at the pinnacle of human evolution, right? So you'll all be pleased to know. They, so they have really good verbatim memory. They are really, they're good at, and they tend to also get the gist from a bunch of words right away. So they have good gist memory, good verbatim memory, and they can rely on either one depending on what instructions you give them, right? All right, so that's high verbatim and high gist. Folks with Alzheimer's disease and similar kinds of neurodegenerative disorders are low in both. And again, this is based on modeling results and all kinds of other things. And so, so they're low in verbatim memory and low in gist memory. So this is where you get really bad functional impairments because uh, healthy aging is typically, so that's a low verbatim high gist is up in this corner. Low verbatim high gist is normal aging. You tend to lose the verbatim memory for details but you still retain the gist. Once you lose the gist, you, you, you lose your backup system, and that's why you have this profound functional you know, impairment when people get these neurodegenerative disorders, because their backup system, their gist, is in fact going away too. And then you get another interesting case of high verbatim, low gist. Does everybody recognize uh, Dustin Hoffman there in a very famous role? 
I don't know, maybe some of before your time. <laughs> this is Rain Man, which I highly recommend as a movie too. So this would be folks with autism, and this agrees with Uta Frith's theory of autism, for example, in which she talks about weak central coherence being a feature of autism. Autism is a style of information processing, in addition to having social components and other things. Part of it, for some kinds of folks with autism, is a high verbatim, low gist style of processing, right? So that means that um, they're more literal, they're sometimes more logical, and less subject to, to these biases we've been talking about. So in some ways, this, they're more rational, uh, but they process information in a different way. So we've introduced this kind of fourfold development. And of course, where are teenagers? Kind of in the middle. Right? They're not quite there yet on the gist. The gist continues to develop as you develop knowledge and, and understanding and insight up apropos of the gestalt theorists in life. Um, and they're not actually, the younger adolescents are not at the pinnacle of verbatim memory either. It kind of begins to level off. But, and we've estimated those parameters in recognition, recall, and many other tasks. So that's a theory of individual differences, at least at its beginning. So here's a summary. Five A's of neurodevelopment. You have Low uh, gist and low verbatim, Alzheimer's, healthy aging, high gist and low verbatim, autism, high verbatim and low gist, and young adults. All right. yeah. And kids are with autism? Um, well, autism can be adults or kids. It's a developmental disorder. But I mean, children are in the same Yeah, they're, they're closer to that end. They're not, yeah, exactly. They show, for example, they don't show framing. Autism folks don't show framing. Exactly. Yeah, very good. All right, so WISP references, what we came to hear about, right? All right, so I'm going to show you, and again, this is just an overview. If you can't process all this, don't worry. We're going to get to data in a minute. I'm going to present some critical tests of some of the leading theories of decision making. Um, expected utility theory is EUT there. That's maximizing utility. That's the really rational stuff, right? Subjective expected utility theory. Um, Prospect theory, cumulative prospect theory, rank dependent, don't worry about all that. We won't show any equations, <laughs> but we're going to show some critical tests of their predictions and compare it to fuzzy trace theory. We argue that we can explain risk preference in terms of these mental representations, verbatim and gist, plus assumptions about values which are applied to your mental representation of problems. So you have values for money, for human life, for health rather than sick, sickness, things like that, that you apply to your mental representations. Your reward sensitivity as an individual and your ability to inhibit, which may be a kind of meta ability, but it certainly has to do with executive processes. We're going to show you that we can manipulate representations experimentally and we can turn on and off your tendency to process just and verbatim. We'll show that risk preference is malleable, and I guess framing effects show that too, right? The fact that framing a pro the same information in different ways changes your preference for risk shows us that that's malleable depending on how we present the choices to you. How you think about your choices matters, yes. Um, and then we're going to show that adolescents differ from adults in representation, but also in reward sensitivity. And this together um, also shows you can manipulate it, but there's some differences due to age as well. And we're even going to talk a little bit about healthy outcomes being predicted, both in terms of measures and manipulation. So here's a, here's a hypothetical choice. Imagine you had a choice, and I've showed you what people normally pick, but try to ignore that part. <laughs> and really think about what would I want? Would I want $200 for sure, or would I rather take a gamble? With a one-third probability of getting $600, that's a two-thirds chance of getting nothing. Most people, not all, most people who are adults prefer A. They prefer the sure win to a gamble. Right? So that's for gains, because you're winning here, you're saving, you're getting money. What, and, and we have an explanation for that, but let me give you the, so, so let me tell you the explanation. The just explanation is if you think about quantities, think about the simplest distinction you can make about this problem. How could you boil down this problem, explain it to your friend in the simplest possible way? It would be, look, you can win some money or you can take a chance and you'll either win money or you'll win nothing. What do you want? So if you think about it in that categorical all or none way, which is the simplest gist, obviously why you, predict, you prefer A, right? Because winning some money is better than winning nothing. That's your values, right? Because you value money, right? So let's imagine the next thing. So if I truncate off the zero, all I do is I took away the two-thirds zero, which in all those theories I talked about equals what? Two-thirds times zero equals? Come on, I can, I can hear you breathing out there. <laughs> 
Zero. Very good. All the theories predict that. It's really, really, you know, it's not hard. So two thirds, so I've literally taken away nothing. Nothing, right? So if I present people one third chance, so you have a choice, $200 for sure or one third chance of 600. Okay, now we say that the, this, this something nothing contrast is gone. What do I have now? I have a trade off. I have less money with higher probability, more money with lower probability. Now I'm on the teeter chatter, right? Now I'm thinking of this as a trade off. So according to fuzzy trace theory, the framing effects where you prefer the gain. By the way, I should say, if this was losses, I should have done the losses. Imagine this is losses. Um, you lose $200 for sure, one third probability, you know, two thirds probability lose, or one third lose 600. If these are losses, what do you prefer then? Now you want to gamble because nobody wants a sure loss compared to the possibility of losing nothing. So the framing effect is risk, seeking, risk um, avoiding for gains, risk seeking for losses. So that's the framing effect because it depends on how you frame it as gains or losses. All right, so if I take away zero, literally nothing, now you think of it as a trade-off. All those theories I told you about before, they make exactly the same prediction for these types of problems because it's the psychophysics of the one-third, it's not linear, it's the 600, that's not linear. You know, you kind of have a diminishing returns kind of thing, and so one-third of a smaller number is a smaller number, you, that's actually the whole thing. <laughs> that's the theories, pretty much. And so that should all stay the same. It's literally equivalent from the point of view of all those other theories. But we would say it takes away the main qualitative contrast, which is the, between something and nothing. What about taking away the one third 600. This is the opposite. This now highlights the contrast between getting nothing and getting something. Now, once again, I actually presented this to subjects, but very important. Is this all I told them, that there's a two thirds chance of nothing? The one third could be anything, right? Ah, but I didn't do that. I told them, by the way, if you get nothing, the other option is you're gonna get $600. So all three groups had the identical information, but we focused their processing on the contrast between something or nothing, like here, the gist of the categorical difference, or the thinking of it as a trade-off between probability and reward. So that's all we're doing, but everybody has the same information. We tested them, we gave them quizzes beforehand, we gave them quizzes at the end, we published this in JEP and people want to see it. So it's not ambiguous, but it focuses processing in a way that's either verbatim or gist, right? That highlights the exact numbers and the trade-offs versus highlights the categorical contrast, the qualitative contrast. So here's just a summary of the predictions. Uh, if you highlight the sum none difference, you should get heightened framing effects, more preference for the sure thing in the, in the gain frame, more preference for the gamble in the loss frame. Because now we're talking about losing nothing compared to losing something. Losing nothing is better, the possibility of losing nothing. And then the mixed problem is just your standard regular Tversky Kahneman, both complements the gamble are there. And then the verbatim emphasis on the numbers is when you take away the zero and you're talking about trade-offs. So you say, gee, I could get something, I could get something. So then you up your level of precision. You say, I could get less, I could get more. That still doesn't help me because it's less, more, and they bet. Then you say, okay, expected value. It's, some, it's the 200, is that, does the 600 compensate enough with one third to, you know, to beat out the 200 or not. Then it becomes a psychophysical problem after that, or a trade-off. So here's just the design. We presented more than one problem. In these studies, we present 30 gains and 30 loss problems. So they're all of the form that you saw, but there are, half of them are about lives and other valuable commodities. Half are about money. So there's five problems of each type, gain frame in the non-zero complement condition. Remember, that's the one-third 600 condition, then um, a third of them are in the standard presentation and a third of them are with the zero complement. Now, very important, we present, we had two different sets of materials. And if you got the gain version of one problem, you got the loss version of another problem. So you didn't get the exact same problems as gains and losses. And these are true framing problems. I mean, what I talked to you about was reflection. So it's like, um, does anyone know the dread disease problem with the 200 lives that are saved? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this Asian disease problem. Okay, so most of you have, okay. So 600 people are expected to die, you can save 200 for sure, or there's a one third probability you can save 600, and so on, exactly analogous. Or the loss version is 600 people are expected to die, you can choose between two programs, 400 die for sure, doesn't that sound terrible? Two thirds chance 600 people die. 
one third chan chance nobody dies. So now you want to gamble. So that's a real framing problem because 400 die is the same as 200 saved if 600 people are expected to die from something, right? They're the same. So it's truly inconsistent behavior to have opposite preferences. So this is what we did. And in fact, these are the data. So in the condition where you had 200 versus one third 600, as you can see, framing effects completely disappear. You're pretty much indifferent. 50% of the chance, about 50% of the, of the time, you pick the sure, th the, the gamble in the game frame, which means 50% of the time you pick the gamble, approximately, right? And in the loss frame, it's about 50-50, and there's no difference anymore. These are the identical problems and the identical people. <laughs> so this is within subjects. In the mixed condition, this is your standard framing, you get your nice healthy framing effect where there's more risk taking for losses than there is for gains. And in the gist condition where you heighten this categorical distinction between something and nothing, you get an even bigger framing effect. Make sense? Okay. So why does this disprove prospect theory? Because everything you need for prospect theory is present in this problem. The zero is literally zero. So it's all about your perception of one third, your perception of 600, your perception of 200. And because that's nonlinear, that's supposed to produce the framing effect. One of those things or all of those things. You know, sometimes it's the probability function, sometimes it's the value function, the outcomes function, whatever, you've got all of it here. And yet, no framing effect. Therefore, theory not true. Love prospect theory, but not true. All right. You can love theories that are not true. <laughs> so this is another, this is a part of our developmental predictions. These are intelligence agents. These are real people who shall remain nameless, who make decisions about things like terrorism, and they, they chase people down through bank accounts to see if they're you know, terrorists and so on and so forth. These are like for real. We're real people. We, 36 intelligence agents that we interviewed. And we compared them uh, in all three conditions as well. And as you can see, here there's not a significant difference. In the mixed condition for these intelligence agents, they showed a nice, big, healthy framing effect. So they're in internally inconsistent. It's only, you know, life and death <laughs> for lives and for money. Uh, actually, no, we just did lives with them because of the obvious um, correspondence to their work. And then in the gist condition, you get a much bigger framing effect. And as you can probably tell, there is a developmental difference in the overall size of the effect. Not only is framing present in these experts and in post-college adults, these are people that are post-college alumni of the college students. So we got them at alumni reunions and so on, and they show an even bigger framing effect compared to college students. Um, and the key there is that it's still present even when you're post-college. It's not that the college students, in fact, the college students are the most consistent here, right? Again, yay for college students. Uh, the experts, these are the intelligence agencies, show a significantly greater framing effect on the same problems, again. So uh, not only does development not erase these biases and heuristics, but just like I was telling you about the framing effects in children, they seem to, if anything, get bigger with development, with domain-specific experience, right? With, in this case, with risky decision-making. All right, so this just replots all the age groups, college, um, post-college adults and intelligence agencies by just looking at the difference score and shows them separately by condition. So this is loss minus gain, so it's net difference in risk taking. Does this make sense? Okay. So here you can see in the verbatim condition, no difference from zero really. They're about, they take risk taking about equally often, about 50%. In the complete with both thing, you get a significantly bigger framing effect in the intelligence agency, agents than you get in the college students or the adults. And in the gist condition, now you have stair steps. They're all different from each other. So the manipulation has an effect in changing processing for all three groups, but you also see the developmental pattern. How am I doing? Good. So what about teenagers? You can't talk about risk taking and not mention teenagers, so we should do that, right? So we looked at another sample, in this case 39 adults and 46 adolescents. These were uh, folks in New York City, actually. We were running a neuroimaging study there. So, so this was recruiting as part of that. And here we have all the same predictions, just highlights this simple categorical difference, get something versus get something or nothing, right? Mixed is in between. It's got verbatim and gist elements in that gamble. Then you got your verbatim 
contrast, 200 versus one third, 600. But adolescents, I told you something about adolescents. Adolescents care more about rewards than the young adults do, right? So they're reward sensitive. This is true, right? So 600 is a bigger difference compared to $200 if you're a teenager. Not just because you don't have money, because they have a lot of discretionary income, some of these students. Although these folks vary in SES, both the adults and the, the kids. So 600 is just worth more because two cookies are worth more than one cookie. Rewards in general are, are sweeter and more alluring if you're a teenager. And that effect has been shown in sensation-seeking measures and behavioral measures, and as I said, in the nucleus accumbens. So this is a lot of work showing that. So if you add that and you say, okay, I'm looking at the numbers now, but 600 means more to me than 200, you predict as a function of their mental representation and their motivation for reward, you should get reverse framing. Because the bigger gain is always in the gamble, the way we set up these problems, right? So you should be risk taking for gains and you should be risk avoidant for losses because $400, losing $400 is, is better than losing 600 because it's losing, <laughs> right? So now the sure loss, which adults do not show this, right? Adults show the opposite pattern. So the only time you should really see this reverse framing is in teenagers because of the combination of focusing on numbers and really on quantitative trade-offs and being more uh, motivated by reward. Is this making sense? Okay, I hope so. Okay, so in fact, that's what we uh, saw. Here we have our 39 adults. This is just a replication of what you saw before. These 39 people also do not show framing in the verbatim condition, show moderate framing in the mixed regular standard condition and show big framing effects in GIST. So this is just the same effect you saw before replicated. We've replicated it now a lot. Um, and in fact, and this is very important uh, apropos of Valerie Thompson's talk and other, and other folks who, who talk about these, these choices really being maybe indifferent. So we had people rate their confidence in their choices. Are you basically indifferent? You're just guessing. You don't really have a preference all the way up to maximum preference, which is five. So it's one to five. And on average, across any choice you make, you can see that they're pretty confident, right? They're a little bit more confident when they choose in the gain frame than in the loss frame. But overall, they're pretty confident about their choices. So these are not indifference choices, right? In, in all three conditions, in verbatim, in mixed, and in gist, they're pretty confident about their preferences. That's the adults, all right? Okay, what about the adolescents? Well, lo and behold, you find the rare reverse framing effect here where you have more risk taking for gains than for losses. You have a small framing effect in the opposite direction for standard conditions. And then you have a bigger standard framing effect in the gist condition. So there's an effect of both. There's an interaction, right, for adolescents. They show um, both the effect of being an adolescent and being more reward sensitivity. That's where the reverse came in from. And each one of those conditions is smaller for adolescents than adults. But they also show the effect that you can affect how they prefer risk by focusing their processing more on the verbatim versus more on these simple gist contrasts. So both things are true. We used to call this a treatment by aptitude interaction for those people who remember the person and the situation both matter. Right? All right, so that's adolescents. And also, the adolescents were also very confident, as you can see. They're about equally confident with the adults in their choices. So it's not a question of they're just guessing, they're tossing a coin, they don't really have preferences. They actually have pretty strong preferences, and they're pretty confident in their choices. This just replots everything so you can see it all in one graph. These are the adults over here with their no framing effect. This is the reversal in the adolescents. Uh, in the verbatim condition, there's the mixed condition. As you can, very, you can see it much more clearly here, the adolescents uh, show smaller framing effects than the adults. And again, the adolescents show smaller framing effects than the adults. And as you can see, for gains, there is this slight more gambling or risk preference for adolescents compared to adults. Adolescents compared to adults, adolescents compared to adults. So they are a little bit more motivated by rewards, but that's not the whole story by any means, right? All right. <clears throat> so. Framing effects increase when attention is focused on qualitative gist. They decrease when you focus on, on decisions as trading off numbers. By the way, in my field, in decision making, people think there's no other way to think about decisions other than trading off, that that's the only way to think, as opposed to thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, I had something bad. If I do this once, I might end up with nothing. I better take the sure thing. And that's a legitimate way to think, even if you understood the expected value that you could prefer. Paul Wimshire, for example, who was up there earlier, um, 
it says he can't understand why people who know what the higher expected value is will tell him that B is a higher expected value, but they want A. <laughs> of course they can. There's two ways to look at a decision, right? It's in terms of the trade-offs and in terms of categorical sum none jest. All right, and there's developmental differences as well as differences uh, that we can induce. We can make framing appear and disappear based on the causal mechanism. All right, now. I know you were all paying close attention. You actually, you really seem to be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what should folks with autism show? Should they show bigger framing effects or smaller framing effects? Smaller, that's right. So they should be less subject to frame. Yes, exactly. So um, this is a study by DiMartino et al, 2008. And this is just the same data plotted two ways. This is framing differences, loss minus gain, just like I showed you before with the different scores. And this is just the, the, the control subjects. And these are adult folks with a mild form of autism. And their framing effects are significantly smaller compared to the healthy controls. So they're, in fact, more rational. They're more consistent than so-called healthy neurotypical adults. And that's consistent with fuzzy trace theory. Now, remember way back, I said to you that this was related, this way of thinking about GIST was related to, in fact, um, healthy risk taking in the real world. And that verbatim thinking was more related to unhealthy ways of thinking. And that's another sense in which GIST is advanced. GIST is advanced because it involves meaning and insight, but it's also developmentally occurs, you know, you rely more on it later. So it's advanced in that sense. And as Lyndon asked earlier, a very interesting question, why would you do more of a dumb thing? Right? That's a very good question. Right? So we got to think about it. In fact, you don't do more of a dumb thing. You do more of a smart thing. It's a smart thing. That's what we're arguing. So lab delight. These same adolescents who did the framing cast that I showed you uh, also responded to surveys about their self-reported risk taking. We've also looked at, and other people have looked at, the relationship between self-report, which is anonymous in this case, and uh, real life risk taking, like test giving people chlamydia tests and comparing it with their verbal self-report. And in fact, they do, they do correlate, especially when they're anonymous. People will, in fact, tell you their risk is high and their risk is high and tell you their risk is low and it's low. So, so why is just based intuition health promoting? It isn't just a panacea. We're not saying just good all the time. We're saying, think about it. Most public health risks involve, think of HIV a small probability of a really bad thing. So even if you have unprotected sex, don't tell your friends. Even if you have unprotected sex, transmissibility of HIV is actually fairly low. You know, mum's the word on this, right? So, <laughs> so the, prop, the actual, if you did a, like a, an expected utility maximization kind of analysis, it's quote worth it to take a risk because the benefits of sex are high. Yes, there's a rumor to that effect. <laughs> but the probability of a bad outcome is actually low for teenagers. So many of the public risk, health risks, not all, many of them have that quality to them that if you roll the dice, the odds are with you, right? So if you think of this as a trade-off, then in fact it makes perfect sense to take a risk. In fact, some economists argue exactly that. It's not that adolescents are irrational, that's you crazy psychologists. They're just maximizing expected utility and their utilities differ from yours, hmm, right? But somehow it makes them dead. That's a problem, right? So it, one of the hypothetical examples I give in my research, and we've actually used this as an intervention, is suppose I gave you a million dollars to play Russian roulette. Would you do it? It's a real million in cash, you know. Would you play? No. OK, that was a bit of a long latency. We're a little worried. <laughs> but OK. One out of six bullets, or I can even make it a bigger gun with more empty. She's asking how many bullets. That's a bad thing. <laughs> That's verbatim. <laughs> That's just. Teenagers act exactly the same thing. They say, well, it depends on how many bullets. It depends on how much money. Now, how many among you think that's rational? <laughs> Somehow that has the feeling of, shall we say, irrational about it. And yet, from an economic point of view, it's true, right? A million dollars is a lot of dollars. Very few bullets, very many dollars. Trade them off, right? Very. Yet somehow it doesn't seem right, does it? So verbatim, very rational. Just not so much. Because why? Dead is dead, right? Other ways to have fun. It's very qualitative. It's very qualitative. It's simple, right? Remember that when you tell your friends about this. So, so the idea is that this notion that single acts as opposed to cumulative risk, the odds really often are with you. So 
the tendency to be more gist based is risk is is protective because you're not counting the bullets of the dollars anymore. You're saying, wait a minute, HIV really bad. Don't go there. Don't even don't even think about it. Right. So that's gist, all or none type thinking. And this is, you know, um, a standard curve that you see in the adolescence literature. This is again about reward. So as age increases, and we agree with these, this is Galvan and uh, B. J. Casey and Steinberg and so on, that. Prefrontal areas, it, uh, the ability to control yourself does improve with age. Yes, it does, right? And, so, and your tendency to be reward sensitivity does go up in adolescence, just as I mentioned you before. And they say there's this gap, and that fully accounts for risk taking. But you know what the data are going to show, don't you? Right? It doesn't fully account. It's important, but it doesn't account. So we control for that. So as you can see in this sample, we had a curvilinear relationship with sensation seeking, which we're taking to be a measure of reward sensitivity. It also correlated with what's called behavioral activation, which is approach towards a goal. Me want, good, <laughs> that kind of scale. Those correlated, and that was curvilinear, so that tendency to, to really be attracted to rewards and to have high approach peaks when you're a teenager and comes back down, just like the theoretical curves say it should be curvilinear, right? Your ability, the behavioral inhibition scale goes steadily up. Believe it or not, that's a linear scale. So your ability to inhibit increases across this same age range. And that gap does widen, right? Better ability to control, less attractiveness to reward. You know, except that's not the whole story, right? <laughs> but that is part of the story. And we looked at these same people we talked about, these teenagers and young adults, and, and three kinds of risk taking. We have also have other studies with other outcomes, but this is just one example. Their initiation of sexual behavior. So this is like 15 and a half year olds initiating sex. So this is fairly early. So this is more risk taking for them. We're not talking, you know, 30 year olds. Sexual intentions, their intentions to have sex, and their number of lifetime partners. These are the three self-report measures. And we're going to talk about how gist verbatim sensation seeking and inhibition predict all these outcomes, right? So let's look at the first busy slide. Don't worry, I'll tell you what it means. So this is um, sexual intentions. And as you can see, a gist factor is protected in the sense that uh, the higher your gist-based thinking, and we gave them various measures of it, uh, the lower your sexual intentions, right? The higher your age, which also loaded on the same factor as behavioral inhibition, the more sexual intentions you have, because as you get older, more likely to have sexual intentions. But we control for that. Uh, sensation seeking reward sensitivity is significant. So the more sensation seeking reward sensitive, the more sexual intentions you have. Motivation, right? And then what about our little framing task? Remember that framing task I showed you? The degree to which you, re you reverse frame, you prefer the sure loss from the negative frame and the gamble and the gain frame. And it's not just either one of them separately, it's the difference between them, right? The more you reverse frame, which demonstrates verbatim thinking, right? In fact, it separately accounts for greater intentions uh, to take sexual risks. So it's your thinking and your motivation and just in verbatim, independently predict your, t your susceptibility to um, risk taking in this case. And I think that I know there's se sexual intentions, then there's sexual behavior. Here, just in fact, um, this is a, a logistic regression. So this is a, a risk factor. So you're, you're, you're at lower risk if you're higher in just space thinking. If you're older, you're at higher risk, you're 287% chance times more likely to, in fact, have initiated sex. Sensation seeking is not significant here. As you can see, verbatim, just, or verbatim is not significant here. So these two predict uh, this dichotomous outcome of age initiation of sex, whether you've initiated or not. Right? Controlling for age, just to separately predict. And then finally, the number of lifetime sexual partners. And we did this separately for those who were sexually active versus not. So both analyses show the same thing. Just as you can see, uh, you, the higher your gist based thinking, the fewer number of, of sexual partners you have, the less risk taking you have. Remember, these are young people. Age is sort of P less than 0.06, so more age, more partners. Um, and again, re the greater reverse framing you show, this hypothetical little test that I talked to you about, the more uh, the higher the number of sexual partners. So the more verbatim thinking, the higher the risk, the more just thinking, the lower the risk in terms of self-reported risk taking. And we've seen this in drinking behavior and in other behaviors too. So it may seem 
amazing that a laboratory test, so reward related approach does matter in risk taking, cognitive control or inhibition does matter in risk taking, but also the way people think in terms of verbatim and gist, whether they rely on the bottom line, all or none type simple gist distinctions and think about risk that way, or whether they think about life as a trade off of odds of bullets to, to dollars. Um, as opposed, and this is just another graphic way to, to talk about the same thing. Just to, so, so basically, we, we think so much in these standard dichotomies, you know, that come down to us from Descartes and from Freud and from dual process theory, that it's either emotion or reason, it's either intuition or analysis. There's a third thing. <laughs> so that's basically what I'm saying. There's a third thing, and that's the nature of your thinking about the risk. Do you see the options more in terms of this just based thinking versus verbatim literal thinking? All right, so have we, we've got theory-driven applications. How am I doing? Good. Yeah, <laughs> I shouldn't have reminded you today. Anyway, so um, we also have implemented this, this idea in a number of interventions. In particular, I probably should draw your attention to this one, the Raymond Mills. We took 734 teenagers, they were all high school students, and we randomly assigned them to three groups. One of them got a standard um, risk reduction curriculum called Reducing the Risk that had been shown to be effective. It had a little bit of gisty elements in it, but it was mostly facts and education, and this is what chlamydia is, and this is how you get it, and these, you know, that kind of thing. So, but it had been shown to be effective, which is why we picked it. Then we did another treatment group that was a gistified version that had all the same content as reducing the risk, except it emphasized this gist way of thinking about risk. We used the Russian roulette example. Yes, it's a low probability you'll get pregnant, right? If you have unprotected sex, the odds are with you. But, you know, if you do that for a year, you're going, somebody's getting pregnant. That's, it's just all or none. If you keep doing it, this is what will happen. Okay, so it becomes cumulatively for sure, right? And one out of 12 cumulatively does become, it's, it may be the 11th month, it may be the 13th month, but approximately 1.0. So we emphasize the sort of pivot points, you know, where things, the world changes and it's gonna be this way or that way. HIV, it only takes once to get HIV. We, we told them things like that. Yeah, maybe the problem is one, but it only takes once to get you know. it. And, and in other curricula that people um, teach teenagers, they teach them that that's bad thinking, to say it only takes once. That's not probabilistic thinking. They should be trading off. So it's literally diametrically opposed approaches to risk reduction. And then we had a placebo control, which is about friendship and other kinds of unrelated things. So what we showed is that, um, there were 12 outcomes that were significant and that remain significant over long-term retention. So self-reported initiation of sex was lower in the GIST group compared to the, the treatment group and the control group. Um, and in particular, these kinds of outcomes endure, we think, because they're GIST-based. People walk away from a curriculum and they don't remember if you know, HPV has a 24% you know, uh, incidence level in that population, but they remember it was kind of surprisingly high, <laughs> you know. They remember the gist, they don't remember the ver verbatim. So that it makes sense that you would have less fade out if you emphasize the essential bottom line because of the work we know on memory that have been done on memory for gist of information. There's other things we've done with uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. We did a randomized control trial and um, you know, a pre-test, post-test. And we showed that value concordant um, decisions in a web-based tutorial went from 35%, where people are making decisions about medication that agree with their values. <laughs> they went from 35% agreeing with themselves to 64% after they got the gist information about the medications. I thought that was sort of impossible to summarize the gist of arthritis medications, but there are ways. Um, and it was very qualitative and they got it and then they were more likely to make decisions that were related to their values because they could match them up. They knew what their options really boiled down to, the gist of the options. And then also we looked at breast cancer and genetic risks, which also involve conditional probabilities and some of the topics that people have talked about that I didn't have a chance to talk about, class inclusion, reasoning, and so on. So why do we say a simple gist advanced? I'm always at, almost at the end. Um, because meaning is more advanced than memorization. And this really does have to do with this distinction between type A and type B thinking that the Gestalt theorists talked about. There's a kind of stimulus response or stimulus stimulus mindless memorization. This answer goes with this question, right? And then you forget it rapidly and it doesn't transfer. 
And then there's gist-based understanding, which is meaningful insight into the simple bottom line of the information. And that's retained better. So it facilitates transfer and retention. Reliance on gist goes up from childhood to adulthood. So that should tell us something about what might be good, right? It isn't an airtight case, right? You could be doing more and more of something stupid, but it sure does. When you see it in domain after domain after domain, it certainly raises the question that perhaps development is progress towards gist-based intuition. Memories show this effect. You get more semantic clustering with age. So when people recall words, they recall them more based on meaning. Even when little kids know the meaning, they don't tend to spontaneously cluster based on meaning. So this tendency to emphasize meaning goes up, even when you know the individual meanings of things. False memories increase, recall and recognition, heuristics and biases when they're meaning-based go up. And then experts uh, become more just based So it's not just the intelligence agents, it's cardiologists and so on, base their decisions on simpler and simpler gist the more and more domain-specific expertise they have. Their actual decision for emergency room patients gets simpler and more all or none compared to novices and students. All right, and, and teens, of course. Take-home messages, you're probably familiar with these because I showed them to you before. So risk-taking is not just impulsivity and emotion, although obviously it is affected by that too. Most teens take risks because they are thinking, not because they're not thinking, in the sense of analysis. They're trading off the bullets and the dollars, the risk and the reward, and they're thinking, is this worth it to take this risk? Do I go for it? Some risk-taking is impulsive. That's separate and independent source of variance. But much of it is when they rate their perceptions of the benefits and risks under very cold conditions, like in a survey, that predicts their behavior. That should tell you something, right? It isn't just in the moment I lost my head. When they're in the lab filling out the survey saying, how, what's the probability of a bad thing? How good is this good thing to you? That very analytical kind of response predicts their behavior in study after study after study. When I reviewed the literature, people said, well, I got this weird result that the you know, risk perceptions and benefit perceptions actually predicted behavior. I must be the only one. Like study after study showed that. So it violates the predictions, but it's true. We predict risk preferences and other just based biases. We predict that they increase from childhood to adulthood. Uh, risk taking for rewards declines and biases increase because just based intuition increases. Then is review of the literature, et cetera. They are malleable, but there's effects of development. So both of these things are true. And the degree to which we can change people's thinking about risk and sort of goose that development along. We were successful several times and other people have been successful. We can't totally change everybody, right? But we can change a significant number of adolescents to think in a more qualitative way so that they have healthier outcomes. Thank you.